Lately, it feels like there's been a lot of discussion about artificial intelligence and its impact on just about every aspect of our lives. It's both the greatest threat or the greatest opportunity, depending on who you ask. Silicon CEOs can't stop gushing and bragging their jobs to AI. Just ask the writers and actors now striking in part because of how studios plan to use their work and their likeness with AI here. You probably remember this AI generated, or in other words, completely fake photo of the Pope wearing a fashionable puffy jacket that fool who decided one day to create the image using an AI program, which was easily available online. It's a pretty harmless example of how AI can easily spread information, but it gives you a sense on how easy that is. But take a look at how the RNC launched an AI generated attack ad against President Biden. It's designed to look and sound like actual news reports to scare voters into thinking that a big dystopian nightmare awaits America if Biden is reelected. We also have these AI generated images showing former President Trump resisting arrest in Manhattan after his indictment. It seems silly and fairly obvious to say, given how closely we've all followed this, but this did not actually happen. Look, technology is always changing how campaigns try to persuade and turn out voters. I remember how social media played a big part in turning out first-time voters and young people to elect President Obama in 2008. In 2016, remember how Facebook troll farms and disinformation campaigns played a significant role in electing President Trump? So heading into 2024, the big question is how will artificial intelligence impact how political campaigns reach voters? And what should we be worried about? Joining me now is Alex Stamos. He's the former chief security officer at Facebook. He's now the director of Internet of the Internet Observatory at Stanford University. He's also director of the Krebs Stamos Group, which focuses on cybersecurity. I can't think of anyone better to help me understand this. So your research, Alex, found that AI can write propaganda that was just as persuasive as Russian or Iranian propaganda. How does AI have the potential to create even more challenges heading into 2024 as you look at how it could be used to influence people in the country? Uh, that's right, Jen. Our Stanford team has uh, recently published a paper in which we tested AI-generated propaganda against real known Iranian and Russian propaganda with about 8,000 Americans. And it turns out the AI propaganda is just about as persuasive as the stuff written by humans. So this, this is going to have a couple of different impacts. First, it really lowers the cost for different kinds of troll farms, whether they're domestic or foreign, mm -hmm. for them to create huge amounts of content. We, we roll the back the clock back to 2016. And you talk about the Russian Internet Research Agency. That is the group that did a lot of the work on behalf of the Russians to mm -hmm. uh, have all that content on Facebook and Twitter and the like. Um, they had to have a room full of Russians who spoke English. They had to go hire young people with master's degrees who could write as if they were real Americans. If you're doing that work in 2023, 2024, you'd be crazy to do that. One person could use AI to generate the outputs of dozens or hundreds of people. And so I think one of the challenges we're going to see going into 2024 yeah. is the economics of who can run a disinformation factory have totally changed. So just to put a fine to, to find focus on that, I should say, Alex, it means that it could be less expensive for foreign actors, for adversaries, for people who want to intervene in the U.S. election to do exactly that, because they don't need a full room. They could do it through one or two, a handful of people who are using AI tools to push out content. That's right. It, it was not a cheap thing to run a troll farm. Now, a lot cheaper than other kinds of interventions mm -hmm. geopolitically. You know, a line I've always used is that the entire Russian effort in 2016 probably cost less than one fighter jet. But that was still millions of dollars they spent on staffing. And then now you could have one or two people who are doing this. And one of the things that's changed a lot just in the last six months or so is that we've gone from the, cap the AI capabilities that are able to write propaganda that seems realistic to people in their native language used to be only from the big companies. You could get that from OpenAI or Google or Microsoft. And now the rise of these open source models means that hundreds of thousands of people have the technical skill to go download models that run on their home gaming PCs and that are just as good as what you could only get from OpenAI six months ago. 
this all sounds a little overwhelming and hard to control if you're a political campaign. So if, if you're President Biden's reelection campaign or any campaign on either side of the aisle, what would you advise them to do to combat this? Okay, so one of the things we really need for the campaigns is we're going to need norms around the campaign's use of AI. You, you've talked about a couple of examples where AI was used to create fake video or fake images used in campaign ads. This could be a huge uh, area of growth for official campaigns, super PACs, and the other kinds of big spenders in online advertising. Uh, the, this path started in 2012 with President Obama's reelect, where they really got good about, for the first time, using social media for political advertising, and was really perfected by Trump's campaign in 2016. And one of the things you saw the Trump campaign do in 2016 is they generated dozens and dozens of different ads, and then they tested those ads to see which ones were effective with different segments of people. So they test how how does this one do with steel workers in Michigan? How does this do with stay-at-home moms in Pennsylvania? And from those tests, they then decided, where are we going to put our money? And that was one of the reasons, I think, that Trump won, was that his campaign was actually much better at that kind of advertising. That content was created by humans. So they had to have a bunch of people who were putting together audio and video and cutting these ads. Now you can have AI do that. And I think that's one of the scary things that we might see is that the campaigns themselves could decide to ask AI, create me a thousand different ads on abortion, and then test a thousand different ads with a thousand different segments, and then use that data to go figure out where the money is. And so you can effectively manipulate people through these ads that maybe are only shown to 300, 400, 500 voters at a time that have been built by AI and then tested specifically to be influential to those people. And I think that's the kind of thing that we, we need first norms around, and we probably need new campaign finance legislation to try to control that kind of manipulation. But that sounds to me, Alex, I mean, beta testing, I think, is what it's generally called, right, which a lot of companies and organizations do to test effectiveness of ads, is different than what I always think about as the most craziest concern here, which is, which is the images or voices of candidates being used to spout things that they haven't said or never said, or maybe they wrote but they didn't say. How can that be managed? Right. That, that's a huge problem. We've already seen an example of the DeSantis campaign running an ad in which they used a AI-generated voice of Donald Trump to say something that I believe he wrote, but that he had never said. So they're kind of pushing the edge of effectively generating a quote that can be attributed to him, but that they don't have any audio for. Um, I think that's completely inappropriate. Uh, we should not allow any kind of artificial generation of video, photos, or voices from real individuals. And I think this is just a general problem in our laws right now, is we don't have a legal kind of right to publicity around AI content. As an individual, somebody right now could take this video that we're making, they could download it, they could load it up into a model, and then they could create a fake Alex Stamo so they could make say anything. Um, and I would have no legal recourse to prevent that. So I think the problem is bigger than just political campaigns. We mm -hmm. really need a law that prevents the use of AI to generate content that seems to come from real people. You're going to create fake people? That's something we can argue about, right? But you really should not be able to create something that makes it look like somebody is saying something. That should be effectively defamation. Um, and we need an expansion of defamation law to be able to cover that. And I think that kind of expansion would then also help in the political sphere. So it's absolutely bigger than politics, and I'm so glad you raised that point, because I think people have seen a lot of headlines, but they don't know what to make of it. And there was this recent study um, that jumped out at me. An expert at the Copenhagen Institute of Future Studies estimates that, quote, 99 percent to 99.9 percent of the Internet's content will be AI generated by 2025 to 2030. I mean, is that consistent with your assessment? Um, and what does that mean people should be preparing for in terms of how they distinguish between what's AI generated and not? So I'm not sure about those numbers, but what, what I can say is that a huge amount of the kinds of abuse we've seen in the past is already becoming AI generated. So, for example, in the, the tech industry, we have this term non-consensual intimate imagery is effectively that that is the technical term for revenge porn or non-consensual nudes. This has been a problem for years where people have their phones broken into or their nude images forwarded and then stored up in the cloud and they have no ability to control who sees them. Um, 
that has become now an area where there's a bunch of AI work where people are now generating nude photos of people they know, either for their own gratification or to try to uh, insult those people, to try to harass those people. Um, the targets are usually women, what, what all the studies show. Um, that has already become a huge problem, and we're also seeing that around children. And in fact, our, our team just wrote a paper around the use of AI to generate artificial child sexual abuse materials, some of which uses the faces of real children, but then puts those children in, in horrible sexual situations. So we're already facing this issue where abuses that we've seen in the past have become scaled out and have become much worse because there's no guardrails around the use of generative AI, AI to do this work, especially when you're using open source models where you can download them and then take any safety protections out of them. Alex Stamos, thank you so much to discuss on this topic, and we look forward to talking with you about it more in the future.